Well, why don't you just grab a hand right there. We're just going to pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the evening. Thank you for what you've done already and people that you've touched and healed on our online family and in the, in the house here. We, we pray, God, for your anointing to be on us tonight. We pray for an extraordinary night. Yes. Lord, we know that we, we have no power to make extraordinary nights happen, but we know that you do. And we pray, God, for Christmas miracles. We pray for... We pray for hope to rise in us. We pray for people, as we've prayed already tonight, for long-term illnesses and long-term problems, Lord, that you would, that the uns, and the end suddenly would happen tonight and people would suddenly get well and they would suddenly find their finances uh, healed and their, their relationships healed. And we, we pray, God, that you would just uh, open the doors of revelation to us and that you would give us the keys to Revelation, Lord, that we could, that we could, um, we could walk in, in your understanding. And when we bless this night as a, as a night that you've ordained and that you've made. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I, this is um, going to be, well, I don't know, it, a little different for me. I, I love to teach. I really do love to teach. And, and I, uh, I, I, love, I love the Bible. <laughs> it's good, right? It's so good. I still love the Bible. This word's going to be a lot more a, a prophetic kind of declaration. I, I have some things going on for the last, well, a long time, but really for this year in the last month or so. So, and I, I shared these prophetic words uh, two times in my teaching this this um, in, on Sunday mornings, but. I, I, sometimes the Sunday night crowd isn't the same crowd as Sunday morning, so I just want to share these just to open up the the night. Um, the Lord told me uh, this is yeah about probably three weeks ago that there would be Christmas pregnancies and September babies. So if you are uh, wanting to get pregnant and you're married, <laughs> you haven't been able to, <laughs> uh, would you just stand right now? You, and if your wife's not here, you can stand for for your family. We we would know if you're it's a man. If you're a man, you're not standing to get pregnant yourself. But if there's anybody, good. Some of you are like arguing whether you should stand or not. <laughs> Is there anybody else? Good. Want to just extend your hands to them. Um, this works really well. I, I'm really good at this. I mean, I'm really good at praying <laughs> for this. The Lord's really good at this. Lord, we declare, you said Christmas pregnancies and September babies. So we release right now, Lord, we release children to these that are standing and more children. And Lord, we pray that if there's any uh, biological or physiolo phys physiological problems uh, in them, that you would just heal them right now and that, you would bring, that you'd bring this about in Jesus' name. And Lord, that you'd do more than they ask. So you'd give them like more babies than they even maybe ask or think. <laughs> and we just release them in Jesus' name. Amen. You can receive that. And, uh, um, and, and then this, uh, the Lord uh, told me that this is the year of the comeback kid. It's the year of rebuilding, restoring, restoration. It's the year, 20, he said 2024 will be the year of second chances. And, uh, and, and I just heard some of these, I, like these, this wouldn't encompass everything, but it's the, uh, you know, failed businesses, failed marriages, failed fatherhood, motherhood, failed churches, failed attempts at a record, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it's really the year of second chances. And if that really resonates with you, would you just stand and let us pray for you? By the way, online family, I'm sorry I ignored you in the first uh, get pregnant one, but <laughs> hopefully you stood for that one. If you were driving, just open up the sunroof and stand for the Lord. Um, if, you, if you just really feel like you need a second chance, um, would you just stand? I, I, you know, I don't want to say specifically what second chance for, but it's just, you're just really feeling like that's for you. Just stand, please. Lord, I thank you for second chances. I thank you for third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. But Lord, I thank you that you declared that this year would be the year of second chances, the year of do-overs, the year of, of restoration, the year where you erase regret, and the year where failed attempts become successful attempts and where attempts at uh, marriage and, and business and uh, just things that are really important to us that you 
redeem them. So Lord, we pray for our online family, for, our on, for those who are here in the room on campus. Lord, we pray that you, we would hear so many testimonies in 2024 of second chances, that it worked the second time. And we bless those who have stood by faith for a second chance in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit. Um, this is more of a, a global, I mean, a, a national word. Uh, uh, this is the beginning of a tipping point for government, I heard. There will be surprise candidates win in the northwest of the country, setting off a chain reaction. So let's just pray for that. Lord, we, you said the lot's cast, but the decision belongs to the Lord. And Lord, we, we thank you that we, you've given us a responsibility to, to vote and to be, uh, to be um, res, you know, responsible in our communities and our, in our government. Lord, we pray that you, that you would make the decision, that you would be the decider, that you would put, you're the one who puts kings in place and presidents and prime ministers and governors and, and, and senators and governance in, in general, Lord. You're the one who raises people up and you're also the one who puts people down. You're the one who takes people out of office and Lord, you said uh, that if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted, but if you exalt yourself, that you will be humble. And so, Lord, we pray specifically for this word about the northwest of the country, that, Lord, that you would specifically, with your sovereign power, put people in office that you deem worthy of that. And, Lord, that they would start a chain reaction of righteousness and justice would begin to rule our country. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, now, what I actually want to talk about tonight, I call this, it's halftime. And the other uh, day, this is probably uh, not more than a couple weeks ago, um, I was uh, praying specifically for somebody, and I said to them, uh, it feels like halftime for you. And uh, as I said that, I, you know, I felt like, oh, I feel like it's halftime for us. And I, I don't know um, how many of you, you know, like sports or, or watch sports. So, um, yeah, I know, obviously you know that I do. Uh, and I, I love that the Lord speaks to us in language that we understand. I love that the Lord told, you know, agricultural parables to people who lived in the agricultural age. And when he talked about, you know, vines being pruned and sowers sowing seed, he was speaking to farmers and people that lived in that, in, in that, in that agricultural area. When he talked about sheep being lost and um, sheep and goat nations, he was talking to people that Knew, that understood the, those analogies, that th that was the language that they would use. It was the language of the people. And I, I, first of all, I, I want to say prophetically, I, I, I want to say uh, practically that when the Lord speaks to us, he often speaks to us in our own language. Like the Lord's so brilliant that he can give you analogies that are meaningful to you and may not be meaningful to anyone else. I was thinking about some of the analogies in the Bible where Jacob lays his head on a rock and he sees a, a ladder uh, from earth to heaven and he sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And I, I propose there's probably is no ladder going to heaven. <laughs> there's probably not you know, you know, a ladder a, a, a billion miles long. But the Lord spoke to, to Jacob in a language that he could understand. That there was angels coming and going and, the, and that what facilitated that in the, in the vision was a ladder. And, and I'm just saying that to say that the Lord often speaks to us in a language, our language, not his language. I, I, I think that Jesus said to his disciples, if I tell you earthly things and you don't understand them, how would I tell you heavenly things? If I tell you earthly things, in other words, if I tell you things that have a earthly, uh, you know, an earthly example, or an er I can tell you, an er give you an earthly example of this thing that 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 is actually lives in the kingdom, how will I tell you things that don't have any earthly example? <laughs> How would I tell you things that are from a completely different dimension that actually have no earthly shadow? And so I believe the Lord often speaks to us in language that we understand. And in, in professional uh, sports, and I, I, it's football season right now. And, <laughs> yeah, come on. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> we had a cowboy Christmas a couple of nights ago and someone came with a cowboy outfit on like, Cowboys, you know, the Cowboys, the football team. It was disgusting. <laughs> I, 
In professional football, there are half times, and half time just isn't just a time to rest, but it's a time of reflection and a moment to analyze and make adjustments as necessary. Often the team that's behind will win the game because of the adjustments that they make at halftime. Furthermore, coaches are evaluated by how well they make adjustments and develop a winning strategy when they're losing at halftime. Teams watch film of the first half of the game to evaluate how they're playing the other team and how each player is working against the opposing player. And um, I, I, I feel like the Lord has taken us, I feel like, I, I, well, here's a word I heard. January is gonna be a halftime for the body of Christ. And uh, we're going to, uh, I don't know if Dan has told you yet, but we're going to have a seven-day fast in January that, uh, that Dan and the team felt strongly that it was a time of, it was a time of reflection. It was a time of, it, I'll say this, I, I feel like that, 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 ha, that, that um, fast is a resetting of many of our strategies, and, and, and I feel like the Lord, I feel like, there are, I feel like the Lord is setting us up so that this halftime, it's like, it, it, it's time to like, you're evaluating the, the game. Can you do this parable with me? Okay, so this is a parable. So, you know, it has nothing to do with the game, right? You understand that? So, I, I feel like we're in this game of life. And I'm talking about, first of all, I want to talk to us individually. That we're in this game of life. And that there are seasons and times when the Lord goes, just takes us out of the game, sets us on the side. And I'm not talking about so that we can watch the game at, on the sidelines. I'm talking about so that we can not just get a rest, but that we can, get a, we can begin to reflect. And if you will, watch film of how we've been doing and, uh, and ask ourselves through a, a, a real honest analysis of our life and say to ourselves, how are we doing? Are we winning? Are we losing? And I'm talking about winning and losing in things that matter in life. I'm not talking about how much money you make or you know, uh, how famous you are or how many you know, uh, followers you have on TikTok. I'm not talking about those kind of values. I'm talking about the kind of values that have eternal purpose. And that oftentimes we... We get involved in life and we lose sight, and not because we're bad people, but we just lose sight of the things that are important. You know, uh, Jesus told this parable of, uh, in, in Luke 15, and John 15, of the vine and the branches. I know you know this uh, parable pretty well, unless you're a, a pretty new believer. But uh, he, he said, I'm the, I am the vine and you are the branches. And then he went, he, he began to explain that that every branch that's in him gets pruned back to its place of life. If you have no life, if, the branch, if that branch has no life, he prunes it all the way back to the vine. If it has life someplace, he prunes it back to life, back to where the life is. And a really cool thing about that analogy is if you know anything about, uh, about vineyards or vines, and I didn't except for my uncle owned a vineyard, which... I, I never cared about, like I was 15, 16 when I worked in the vineyard and it was, you know, always forced upon me <laughs> and I, I'm sure I didn't do a very good job. But I do remember, I was reading about uh, vines, uh, this is many years ago, probably 10 years ago. Actually, I was, I was doing, a, uh, sharing a message on John 15 and I was doing some research on vines. That means Googled it. <laughs> 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 that, that's what I mean by research. I don't want to exaggerate. It was probably like 40 minutes long. And, uh, and I, I remember, uh, okay, well, that's what was going on when I was a kid. My, grand, my, my uncle would have us prune uh, the vine, and he, and he told us, okay, what I want you to do is prune the vine back to where the fruit was. And so, uh, and the way that vines grow is, um, they, you know, it, like think about a vine that's 20 feet long. Um, and a branch that's 20 feet long. And, you, you know, if you, if you look at the branch, it, it'll have fruit, and then it'll have, you know, fruit and leaves, and then it'll have just leaves, and then it'll have a stick. And the crazy thing about a vine, and the reason why you have to prune a vine, is if there is no vine dresser, if the farmer doesn't prune the vine, that vine will only grow sticks. Like, it will be, it will, it will use all of its energy and all of its nutrition to grow a vine as, lo as long as it can go and it will end up with no leaves on any of it and no fruit. <laughs> and, and when you wait that long, all you can do is trim it back to right to the vine. <laughs> 
But most of the time, you, you know, if you're halfway decent farmer, you're trimming that vine back to its fruitfulness. Like where the fruit ended, you cut it off right there. And how many know you're pruning with a promise? I, I want to point out that when God prunes us, he's pruning with a promise. Like no, one, no farmer prunes for less fruit. No farmer goes, oh, we just got way too much fruit. Let's cut half the fruit off. It's like, no, no. You're pruning so you can have more fruit. So the vine will put its energy in what, it's, was, what it was destined to do, which is bear fruit. Are you with me? And what I'm getting at is, uh, I, I, what, you know, one of the things that I, that I see at halftime is that we get to analyze, or if you will, be introspective with the Holy Spirit, because I think introspection without the Holy Spirit is, ends up in condemnation. But because the Lord's declared January is halftime, I'm saying we get to look at the vine and, and I think that part of what happens, in, at least in my life, is that if I'm, if I'm just going like row, row, row your boat gently down the stream with all the other boats that are going gently down the stream, <laughs> that we end up with comparative ways to uh, evaluate how we're doing. Do, do you know what I'm saying? And, and, and I compare myself to the people around me and I go, well, I'm doing what they're doing and I'm going at the speed they're going at and I'm giving as much as they're giving, I'm sacrificing as much as they're sacrificing, and I have this external way that I evaluate how I'm doing. And sometimes we get in a race to see who can have the longest branch, not realizing that none of us have any fruit on it. And let me me be kinder, because I actually don't think that's true. We have many branches... (laughs) And some of our branches are very fruitful and other branches are just long. And we end up in a branch race and we compare each other's branch, how long's your branch, how long's my branch. And we end up with value systems and I don't mean we do it consciously or evilly, but we end up with value systems that really have nothing to do with eternal purpose. And because we live in this eternal yet finite world, like we're living in the finite world, looking towards the infinite, it's easy to to adjust our lives towards the good things instead of God things, right? And um, and it's easy to become part of the rat race and not realize that we're you know we're on this hamster wheel and like. We're running really hard, but we're really not getting anywhere. And sometimes I evaluate my life, and I'm talking about me now, on how hard I work, and I think that hard work equals much progress. And at my age, I can tell you that I don't even have to read the Bible to know that that's not true. Because I've worked my butt off many times only to be, you know, arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and realizing that what I spent the last eight months doing just sunk. And I'm like, I wish I would have known that was sunk, that was gonna sink, because I just spent a whole bunch of energy on something that seemingly didn't matter at all. (laughs) I spent an entire year, I owned an auto parts store in Reading, owned three of them. I, 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 <laughs> I spent an entire year remodeling the Reading store and went broke three months later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like coming in at night, you know, from Weaverville, painting my team coming in, everyone's sacrificing, and three months later we closed the doors. That's like arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Like what could I have been doing instead of doing something that wasn't even going to work? And, and I'm pointing out that oftentimes we're working really hard and we think that effort is somehow anointed progression. Now, you're looking at a guy who likes to work hard. And I don't l- like lazy people. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that from the podium. No, I like you. I just don't like being around you. No, I just don't want you on my team. <laughs> okay, let's move on. 
No, I mean, I really love you, but I just don't want you on my team. So I'm just pointing out that I, I have a high value for hard work. I have a high value for perseverance. I have a high value for people who try. I, I have a higher value, I have a higher value for the work ethic for people who try and fail than people who try not at all. So, so I want you to understand that that, you know, for all the people in the front row, they all, they all know me. They're like, okay, they're reading me through the understanding of being with me for many years. So I'm not trying to promote laziness. I'm just saying that working hard doesn't equal progress all the time. Doing something you're not supposed to do just equals worn out. And I want to tell you why I know that. No, it's going to be funny, but I won't. Half times. I want to talk about half times. Luke 4, if you want to turn there, I'm probably going to more tell stories than anything because I have like 10 of them. And we'll read some. Did you ever think about the fact that Jesus lived on earth, you know, in, in the flesh, three and a half years? I'm sorry, 33 and a half years. Still chasing horses. I was trying to see if you guys were actually listening. False teacher, false teacher. Jesus lived 33 and a half years. Almost everything we know about Jesus is about three and a half years. I mean, we know a little bit about when he was 12 and and I'm sure there's, there's, you know, there's a, a lot of historic, historic facts about Jesus' early life. But I mean, in the Bible, it's, we know when he was born, we, we have quite a bit of information around that first two or three years of his life. And then a, a little bit later, when he's like 12 and he's in the temple. But I mean, besides that, we actually don't know much about the life of Christ. And I have a question for you. It's not a question I'm going to answer. It's just a question. I don't even know if the, if the question has an earthly answer. How important was the first 30 years of Jesus' life? I mean, how important was it? Like, we don't know much about it. I, I, I mean, on one side I could say, well, you know, the, the, the Gospels don't talk a lot about it. So, I mean, if it was really, really important... I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying, seemingly, this is just Chris Valentin externally processing, probably wishing he didn't tomorrow morning. <laughs> like, if it was really, really important, I would think that we would know a lot about, about it. And, and I'm talking about if it was really important for us to know. Right. So, what we know mostly about Jesus' life is three and a half years. And those three and a half years in my analogy, start it with a halftime. Look at this, Luke 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Um, this is uh, Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist, and then he goes from there into the wilderness, and it says that Jesus is led into the wilderness by, capital S, by the Holy Spirit for 40 days. And we don't know a lot about those 40 days except for, for the first 39, for 40 of those days, he didn't eat or drink. And on the 40th day, it says he became hungry. So what we know is for 39 days, he wasn't hungry and I would assume not thirsty. So a supernatural fast. And on the 40th day, he's hungry. And this is the information we have. When he's hungry on the 40th day, the devil comes to him. Now, the information we have from John the, and, uh, and Luke, or, or uh, Matthew and Luke, Matthew 4 and, and Luke 4, is that um, the devil comes to him on the last day. So he's not like being tormented for 40 days. It's like on the last day, when he's hungry, Satan comes to him. And we have the temptation in the wilderness. And I think for the sake of time, um, and, and it's actually a whole preach right there. I've preached many times, worthy of preaching. But he basically 
the devil ends up saying, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world for they have been handed over to me. And Jesus tells him, you should worship the Lord your God, serve him only. And basically he beats the devil in the wilderness. And then it says this, Luke makes this point. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him for an opportune time. And Jesus returned to Galilee, I love this, in the power of the Spirit. So he goes in the wilderness led by the Spirit on the first day. And he leaves the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And from that day on, we know lots about Jesus. Because now Jesus begins to do public ministry. He begins to heal the sick. He begins to cast out demons. He begins to make wine for weddings. And, and all of a sudden, Jesus, after those 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus seemingly shifts gears from a private 30-year life to a very public three and a half years. I, I don't know how, um, how do you think about that. And I, I don't know, like, I, I'm sure that was all divinely planned, like 30 years of private, a private life, you know, living amongst his family, doing what humans do, God becoming human. If you didn't hear Dan's message, you should watch it. It was incredible, incredible theological explanation of the life of Christ. I thought it was incredible. It took pages of notes. But so I, I'm sure this was all divinely planned, but here's the point I'd like to make. And, and, and maybe, maybe the scripture's not making this point as strong as I am. When Jesus goes in the wilderness, I'm calling, I'm calling this halftime from my illustration. He's 40 days in the wilderness and whatever happened in those 40 days completely and totally trans, transforms his life and ministry. He leaves that 40 days. And I can't say he's a different person, but he's a man on fire. I understand he's God on fire. I get that. He's a man on fire. He is confronting the Pharisees. He is, he's healing the sick. He is teaching in the synagogues. He is he, he, seemingly suddenly, there's a dramatic 10x increase in everything he's doing. He ends up at a wedding. You know the story of the Canaan wedding. It's uh, John, in John 4. And his mama says, you know, they ran out of wine. And his mama says to him, you know, hey, they ran out of wine. And I, I know this is kind of, I say it as a joke sometime. But he says, what does that have to do with me? But my point is, is that Jesus had to be making wine at home. Because think about this. No, I mean sincerely. Because it says it was his first public miracle. So if she had never seen Jesus done, do a miracle, and if she had never seen Jesus like it, multiply food or do something with food while he was living the 30 private years, she would have no clue to have him do something for, for multiplying wine. I, I'm pointing out that in my assessment, those little, like, those little tiny sh short revelations into the life of 30 years of Jesus. Like, mama had to see Jesus doing miracles. She had to have. Otherwise, she would have no, there would be no motivation for her to go, they're out of wine, make wine. And my point is, is that Jesus was doing miracles long before anybody knew about it. I mean, he's probably inside family. I would assume that there was supposed to, that, that, that God taking on flesh had to be, had to have a common human experience before he had a very public ministry. Yes. I'm saying that had to be the divine plan. And I understand that we have teenagers, Tom was telling me about his daughter, that are already moving in ministry at 14, 15. And I'm saying, Jesus probably was too, but it was around a small group of people. And, 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 and likely, there, there was, this is just my own interpretation. Likely, there was some kind of confidentiality 
around that. I mean, seemingly Jesus is doing stuff, but he's not wanting to expose himself to the multitude yet. And yet he goes in this 40-day fast and suddenly something opens up and whatever was going on at home was suddenly exposed to the world. Are you with me? And I, and I feel like, and I understand I'm using the life of Christ, but I, I feel like we're in, we're entering January as this, can I say, I'm not talking about going on a 40-day fast, but I am talking about a, ti- a, a time out. Like we're at halftime. And it, it, it's a time, I believe for many of us, it's going to be a time where what we're kind of doing in a public, in a private setting of our own home, so to speak, and it's often in our privacy of our own inner world, that the Lord wants to open that door. He wants to prune off some things that we're doing that are like really fruitless. And we're like, Lord, but everyone else has long branches. And the Lord's like, yeah, but you don't. I'm put... <laughs> Yeah. But Lord, I'm 20 feet long. And the Lord's like, no, actually, you're only fruitful for four feet. We're going to trim you back there. Uh, but we're going to make you more powerful and your energy. And I feel like there's this thing about strategy where the Lord's going to set us down and go, you're using a lot of energy. Listen, I'm not mad at you, but you're using a lot of energy because you're taking your cues from other people, what they do. And I want to give you, I want to give you my priorities so that you can metaphorically come out of the wilderness, come out of time out with a new strategy and win the game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, this is my football analogy and I just watched a game. So, uh, you know, the person who, ha- the, ga- the team that has the most yards often doesn't win the game. <laughs> the team that has the ball the longest often doesn't win the game. Like, it, it, it doesn't matter how long you, how often you hold the ball or how many yards you make. It, it only matters if you score. <laughs> Are you with me? And, and, and I, I watched the game the other day where one team had the ball for 42 minutes and the other team had the ball for 18 minutes. And it was like, the score was like 40 to zero, 40 to three. <laughs> and like the team that had the ball the longest didn't score. It's not about running back and forth. It's about scoring. It's about winning. You with me? It's not about let's measure who can run back and forth on the court to the, the most times. It's about getting the ball in the basket. It's about scoring. It's about bearing fruit. It's about winning. Are you with me? I'm saying there are eternal purposes in our life that we get caught up in finite things. And I'm not saying you, I'm talking about all of us. We get caught up in things that we work our butts off and it doesn't seem to matter to God. And I'm like, what does matter to you, Lord? There are so many, you know, when you get an analogy as a preacher, you suddenly see it everywhere. Do you know what I mean? You tend to see what you're prepared to see. It's like you buy a yellow Volkswagen because you're like, I want to have a unique car. And the day you buy it, so did 40 of your neighbors. And all of a sudden you see yellow Volkswagens everywhere. And you're like, where did those cars come from? And you're not unique at all. You tattoo your whole body to be unique. Anyway. (laughs) I was just being funny. I, I, Elisha in 1 Kings 18, you know, this is the story of Elisha challenges the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And he, he wins that battle and they destroy the prophets of Baal and all of Israel's turned back to God. And then 1 Kings 19, he, uh, he, he, Jezebel says to him, basically, I'm going to kill you. You'll be dead by tomorrow. And a really strange thing happens to him. He almost has like a, a panic attack, definitely has a panic attack. He almost has like a nervous breakdown. And he stands against all of Israel for three and a half years, stopping the rain. And then he starts the rain, then he outruns the chariot. Then he calls down fire and the fire comes down. And that doesn't just consume the sacrifice, it consumes the altar and, and licks up the water and <laughs> eats the bricks. You know, it's, it's pretty good display. And then, and then he kills all the prophets of Baal. It's old covenant, so it's, it's good. <laughs> Bad guys die in the movie, and it's, it's, a good, it's a good showdown. 
And then, then one woman says to him, you die, you're gonna die tomorrow morning. And he just completely freaks out. And he tells God, kill me, my life is over, I wanna die, and he becomes suicidal. And he becomes completely irrational. And he ends up in a cave and he tells God, I'm the only one left. And, and then he says, and, and he begins to recount how the prophets of Baal are ruling Israel when actually yesterday he destroyed them. And how the prophets of God are dying. And like, actually, I'm saying the guy has such like a mental breakdown that he literally doesn't remember that yesterday, yesterday, he killed all the prophets of Baal. And actually all of Israel said, Yahweh's God, Yahweh's God. It's like, all of, actually all of Israel turned to God the day before. And he cannot remember that. And he ends up in a cave, completely exhausted, mentally depressed, suicidal. After his greatest victory, he becomes suicidal. And he actually tells God, I actually don't want to live. Please take my life. And God sends angels to feed him and to give him rest. Literally, he just sleeps and eats. And they wake him and he eats and they put him to sleep and they wake him and he eats. Then he ends up in a cave all by himself. And he's so lonely. He tells God, I am so lonely. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one who's standing for you in all of Israel. I mean, what makes this really sad is how deeply deceived he is. Like Israel, God is actually celebrating, the angels are actually celebrating this man's life. And he's deeply depressed. And he ends up in a cave. I'm calling this his halftime. And God begins to adjust the man. And God tells him basically two things. Get back to your ministry and anoint Elisha in your place. Basically, I want you to stop thinking about you and I want you to start thinking about your legacy. And he enters the cave. As a prophet. And he leaves the cave as a father. And from that day on. Go, go look it up for yourself. All the people who are following him. Are called the company of the prophets. But from that day on. They're no longer called a company. They're called the sons of the prophets. Elisha enters the cave a prophet and he leaves a father. And from that day on, he begins to multiply himself. No longer is it just him. Now it's Elisha and all of a sudden he shows up in cities. He's got like this network of sons that are actually getting revelation through osmosis. Can I say through... Um, it, it, it's coming. It's coming through their. It's, it's coming through impartation. And, and what I'm getting at, obviously, is that that cave time for him, whether it was a day or two or three, it reset his entire life. And to the fact that Malachi prophesied many hundreds of years later, in the last days, I'm going to send Elijah the prophet, and he's going to restore the hearts of fathers to sons and daughters and the hearts of sons and daughters to fathers. He had such a radical transformation in that cave, coming, moving from ministry to fatherhood, that Malachi goes, that's the guy we're gonna send that's gonna restore fatherhood in the new covenant. And I'm pointing out that he wasn't a father at all before that cave experience. He was an angry prophet who called, who, who called down fire, who prophesied against nations, 
prophesied against kids who made fun of him. But when he leaves the cave, he's got a completely different attitude. He's kinder. He's loving. He's caring. He, he, he has an attitude adjustment. Am I making any sense to you at all? I mean, there's so many of them. I have, I have like eight of them here. I, I, I'll, give you, I'll just give you short ones. You know, Jacob has a half time at Jabbok. He's just depressed and discouraged and he's super wealthy. Everything he does turns to gold financially, but he's miserable. Sends his wife's on, goes to, goes, sends his wife and all of his servants on to another city and he, he ends up at Jabbok. You know the story. He prays to God. God sends him an angel. He wrestles with the angel all night. The angel says, what's your name? He says, my name's Jacob. It means deceiver, cheater, liar. The angel says, that's not your name anymore, dude. From now on, your name's Israel, a prince with God. And his whole life from that moment on is shifted. He, he wrestles with an angel. He gets a new identity and he leaves Jabbok. By the way, Jabbok means empty and alone. He leaves Jabbok. He leaves empty and alone. He leaves half time and has a completely different strategy for his life. Not only does he do something different, but he understands that he isn't a liar deceiver. He's not what his father called him. He's not what his brother teased him about. He's not, what, he's not, he's not a cheater and a liar and a deceiver. He's done it all his life. He's cheated and lied and deceived his whole life. And, and the angel basically says to him, that's not who you are, dude. You weren't born to be a liar and a cheater and a deceiver. You were born to be a prince with God. And Jacob has a halftime experience that only lasts seemingly 24 hours. And he leaves that experience a completely different man. We have Saul who is, has zeal for God in the New Testament. He's got this great zeal for God. He actually thinks killing Christians is what he's supposed to do for God. And he has an encounter with the Lord. You know the story. He has an encounter with the Lord in, in Acts chapter 9. And the Lord says, what, Saul, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? You're persecuting me. That had to be a revelation for him. He's like, I have zeal for God. I'm killing these false prophets and these false believers. And the Lord's like, no, you're not. You're actually, you're actually persecuting the guy you think you're serving. Yeah, right. And he blinds him. You know the story. He blinds him. And he sends them to this house. It, this is interesting. I never realized this till yesterday. It's a house on a street called Straight. <laughs> the street's called Straight. And a, and a, a, a disciple named Ananias has a, a vision. And the Lord says, go to this goes to Saul. He's on a street called Straight. Is that profound? Like, I'm going to straighten you out. I'm going to take the crooked places in your life and I'll make them straight. I'm going to straighten out your life. Listen, you're going to be over at, at the house on the street called Straight. And I'm going to send a disciple there and he's going to heal your eyes and he's going to give you a prophecy and we're going to straighten out your life. And I, I just want to tell you that I feel like there are a lot of people that are going to have an encounter on a street called straight. That you believe that you're serving God with your whole heart. And there's people on our online family. And I'm not just talking about non-Christians now. I just think there are people that you spend your life, I spend my life exerting tons of energy, measuring my success by how many yards I run, how long I'm on the field, I'm exhausted. I must be doing something right. And God goes, listen, listen. I want to meet you on the street called Straight. Let's have a talk on the street called Straight. We're going to straighten this out for you. And I feel like January is going to be such a profound 
month for us individually. And listen, if God has 10,000 conversations with us on streets called straight, think about what it's going to do to us corporately. Cornelius is a Roman. He loves God, but it's a God he don't know. He doesn't know the God he loves. I mean, he, he has some understanding because he gives to the Jewish people. He's a centurion, and, and the Jews don't think at this moment, at this moment in time, they don't think that Gentiles are even part of the salvation experience. Like, they actually think if you're not a Jew, you actually can't be saved. So they don't even preach to Gentiles. Let me say it more accurately. It's illegal to have a Gentile in your home. I want to talk about bad evangelism. (laughs) It's illegal to have a Gentile in your home. And Cornelius has a halftime. He's been giving for years to a God he doesn't know. Now, he has to have some inside Holy Spirit stuff going on because he's convicted and convinced that he should be generous to a people that have a God that's real. But he doesn't know that God. And he prays to a God he doesn't know. And one day, and let's just say he's been doing it for 20 years, or 30, or 10 A long time, according to the angel. And the angel shows up one day when he's doing his religious thing. He just does what he knows to do with no Holy Spirit encounter. He just disciplines himself to give and to pray. And the angel goes, your prayers have been heard. (laughs) And your giving has created a monument in heaven. This guy has been doing this for years and all of a sudden someone actually acknowledges that I'm doing something worthy of doing. And he goes, I want you to send for a man named Peter. He's at the Tanner's house by the sea. And in the meantime, Peter's having a half time. He goes upstairs while they're making food. He gets hungry. I don't know why that's in there. (laughs) Except for the vision he has is about food. (laughs) And he has this vision of this, right? These unclean animals coming down. The Lord says, kill and eat. Has this vision three times. Kill and eat. Kill and eat. He wakes up from the vision. He has no idea what it means. He's like, what a weird dream. This vision of kill and eat. You know, I'm hungry, so I don't know. It's related. Maybe it's a pizza dream, you know? So hungry, I start having these dreams about eating things I've never eaten before. And while he's contemplating it, while he's thinking, what could this mean? I'm hungry, and I have this sheet come down with animals, uh, Things that Gentiles eat, but we don't eat them. And he says in the vision out loud, Lord, never have I eaten anything unclean. He's like arrogant about it. He's like, I may be hungry, but I'm not eating that. And when it's all over, he's like, what could that mean? What a weird vision. And while he's contemplating that, at the door is Cornelius' servants. They knock on the door and they go, hey, is there a man named Pete here? We've been sent by Cornelius, an angel of the Lord, talk to him. Hey, Peter, come down here. Some folks coming to see you. And he gets there and they're Gentiles. He's not supposed to talk to Gentiles. And he still doesn't know what it means. But he knows he's supposed to go with them. And he goes with them, and Cornelius has his entire family there. He's gathered his entire family. 
in his house. And when he gets there, Peter's like, hey, you know, we're not supposed to be doing this. What's going on? And Cornelius relates the vision he had. And Peter goes, now I understand the vision. Cornelius relates his vision. And Peter goes, now I understand. Oh, this makes sense now. Oh, unclean. Oh, you're the unclean people. The Lord wasn't talking to me about food. He was talking to me about, it's okay to have a relationship with you. And he's preaching to them. And while he's preaching, get this, he hasn't finished his message. The Holy Spirit falls on them. And they begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. I mean, I'd propose that he would never get to the place where he's like, okay, Holy Spirit's going to fill you. He probably doesn't have any idea Holy Spirit's going to fill them. So he's preaching to them, Lord's like, enough message. Let's just do some signs and wonders. And then Peter, now Peter's got a problem because all the people who are growing their long branches and having branch contests about how many Jews they could lead to Christ... They're all mad at him. He's like, you know you're not supposed to go to Gentiles. Those people are unclean. And he's like, well, let me tell you about the vision I had. And he relates the vision he had. It's actually three times in the book of Acts he relates this vision. How important is it that this vision changed the course of their game? Are you with me? This one vision, I mean, the vision Cornelius has as a Gentile and the vision this, this Jewish man has, this all happens within a few days. This little halftime, it changes the world forever. And you and I are here today. If you're not Jewish, you're here because two men had a halftime at the same time. God adjusted Cornelius and... <laughs> And corrected Peter's theology. And the Gentiles got brought in. And from there on, you start to see whole cities, Gentile cities. And, and now we have the book of Corinthians written to people who were polytheists. They, they worship multiple gods. We have the book of Ephesus, another Greek city. We have, the, we have, we have uh, t- uh, Paul writing to, to uh, Titus at Creed, another completely Jew, uh, um, Gentile city. You got... The book of Romans, another Gentile city. And you've got, all of a sudden, the, the gospel breaks, the, breaks the, 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 the fire of God, jumps over the fire break. And all of a sudden, you've got hundreds of thousands, and I'd say millions of Gentiles being saved. And what's good is that the Gentiles were being saved when the apostles were penning the Bible. Because if the, otherwise, it would just be penned to Jews. And we'd be like, if you weren't a Jew, you wouldn't even understand the New Testament. But it was penned to people like you and me who weren't raised with a Judeo ex, uh, you know, uh, education. It, I, I, it, it was penned to people who knew nothing about Adam and Eve, or who knew nothing about Moses, or wouldn't have known who David and Goliath is. They wouldn't have known those stories. And, but the, because... They got saved in the first century and the apostles were penning the New Testament. They actually were speaking often mostly to the Gentiles who knew nothing of the Torah. Are you with me? But it happened in a very short... My point is, can you see where I'm going? Saul turns to Paul in just a few days. Jesus has a 40-day encounter in the wilderness. His whole life has changed from that. Peter has one encounter, changes his entire life. Ruth meets Boaz after years of being completely poor. And Boaz sees her gleaning in the fields. I'm pointing out that, that 30 days of gleaning changed her life. Are you following me at all? And I, and I believe that we are coming in to a halftime. Like I would prepare for January 1st, yes. not 
to make a new declaration or, you know, what do you call it? Resolution. resolution. I don't want you to make a New Year's resolution. I don't care if you do. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about January is the month of New Year's resolution. No, I'm talking about it's a halftime. Very funny. You know, I, I was talking to a team about halftime. I got on an interview on Friday. I interviewed this guy who uh, has a company called True uh, Play, and they make video games for kids that basically hide the kingdom in video games for little kids. But he said this to me. So, so he's talking to me like three days or two days after I was sharing with our school ministry team about this whole thing about halftime. And he says to me, I, I feel like January is a halftime. He didn't hear anything that I ever said. He said, I feel like January is a halftime. I'm like, bro, talk to me. (laughs) You know, like the Lord uses the same phrase with somebody else. It's like Cornelius meets Peter, right? It's like Saul meets Ananias. It's like two people have an encounter. Saul has an encounter, Ananias has an encounter. Cornelius has an encounter, Peter has an encounter. And they don't even realize, like, you know, Joseph has an encounter, Pharaoh has an encounter. It's like somebody has an encounter, they use the code word. Yeah. Doesn't mean anything to anybody else, but he goes, I feel like January's a halftime. I'm like, are you kidding me? He says, yeah, what do you think? I said, no, I just said that to our team like three days ago. It's not amazing, except for it's like a code word. It's like Holy Spirit's telling him it's halftime. Holy Spirit's telling me it's halftime. Like we are having dual encounters. Somehow we are partners in destiny. (laughs) I had this uh, yesterday, this this morning, this morning I was in Hebrews, just went out to go to the restroom and and, uh, I went through Hebrews. And this, on the way out of the restroom, this gal uh, grabs me. I don't know, she might be here tonight. If you are, you can stand up and tell us this accurately the story. And she said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? You know, I'm always in a, you know, I'm always in a hurry when I'm here. We're always going from meeting to meeting. From in, I don't want to stay out there and talk. I'm supposed to be here. And, and she kind of looked at me and she, said, she realized that I was in a hurry. She goes, it'll just give me a minute. I'll make the, I'll make the story short. <laughs> that usually... <laughs> My short and your short usually aren't the same short. So I said, okay. And she says, she had a little baby. She said, a few years ago, you, uh, you gave me a prophetic word. I said, oh. She said, do you remember it? I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't. She said, yeah. She said, you gave me this word. And the word was, she said, I, she said you said, I see you by the ocean. And the Lord is rolling out a red carpet by the seashore. And when that happens, it's going to change your life. She said, a few years went by, and if you're in the room, please correct my, the details. She said, a few years went by, and, and I, I met this man, and I was dating him, and he took me to the ocean, and he rolled out a red carpet, got down on his knees, and proposed to me. One moment changed her life. She met the man of her dreams. I, 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 there, like something's going to happen in January. I'm telling you, like something's going to happen. And, and, and I, I, this isn't a corporate word. This isn't like something's going to happen at Bethel. I mean, I'm talking about you personally. Like something's going to happen. Like I, I would take this word to heart. I had a three and a half year nervous breakdown. I've written books about it. Listen, if you have a crash, write a book about it. At least you'll make money on it. <laughs> it's better be rich and miserable than poor and miserable because at least you can go shopping. You know what I'm saying? And by the way, because we're streaming, I'm kidding. You have to say that because people like they quote you they take little snippets of what you said they go look he wants to be rich and miserable no I don't I want to be rich and happy that was a joke too I had a three and a half year nervous breakdown I you know we lived in the Bay Area we moved to Weirville all this is like it's horse I, I get tired of telling the story to be honest but I meet a man named Bill Johnson in the midst of that. And I'll never forget the day I met Bill Johnson. He, he, I wasn't on 
the leadership team or anything at Mount Chapel. It was just a church of 40 people. And they introduced this new pastor. I didn't even know we had a new pastor until that Sunday morning. And they introduced this new pastor, and he had long hair, and his wife looked like a hippie. And I, I truly was disappointed. I was like, you know, I, I, I was needing a father. So I was like, I need a father, not a hipster, you know? I, I have some strong judgments about people. You should see what I think about you. Just being funny. I'm not being funny about that, though. I was like, you know, you know, you have this picture of who your next pastor is going to be, and I knew they were doing a pastoral search because we didn't have a pastor. And I was really looking for, like, an older man who, you know, could kind of, kind of anchor me. And then, you know, they introduced Bill and Benny, and I was like, hmm, okay. And then, uh, at the, you know, uh, then after worship, then Bill got up to speak. And he, when he was sharing... Like, I, I could tell you what he's sharing. I wept through the whole message. And I said to myself, I have never heard anyone who knew God like that. And within a week, we were best friends. Like, we were probably in each other's house five to seven days a week for 15 years. We were inseparable. And that man changed my life. Before I met him, all I wanted to do is have a really great world-class repair shop. And the next day after I met him, I'm like, I want to do that. I want to do things that are eternal. I, want to, I don't want to just make a living. I want to make a difference. I, I had been a Christian for five years. I want to teach people the word of God. I want to, I want to encourage people. I want to do wonders and miracles and signs. And, 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 and that one encounter changed my life forever. I, that's why I'm here. I, I want to, uh, I don't know what time we're supposed to be done. Are we supposed to be done right now? Okay. Am I the boss? I, <laughs> I don't, it makes me nervous because Kathy's not in the room, so I don't like being the boss of me when there's not another boss in the room. Okay, uh, okay I'll, I'll, I can do this in 10 minutes. Is that good? Yeah. Halftime adjustments require three things to be successful. So let me give you three things. Number one, an honest assessment of how the game is going. I'm telling you what to do in your month. I said, January's halftime. Yeah. What do I do? First one, have an honest assessment of how the game is going. It's an analogy. Uh, you should write this down. I'm not going to read all these verses. Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, verses 11 through 16. Nehemiah is sent to rebuild the walls. First thing he does, he gets there and he rides his donkey around all the entire Jerusalem wall, making notes about each part of the wall. What's broken down, how, like detailed notes. Likely he has a scribe with him. Hey, note, walls completely tore down over here on the on the sheep, by the sheep gate. The gates are broken. There's no foundation to even put the gate up. I'm sure it was very detailed. Like, we'll need beams here. We'll, the gate's not even there. We'll need to rebuild the gate completely. Uh, just a pile of rocks. And he just went around the entire wall, listing in great detail exactly what was wrong with the walls and the gates. Took him all night. There's a lot of people, and I think probably we've all been there, who call denial faith. If you can't look at your problem and still have hope, that's not called faith. That's called denial. And you can't conquer what you refuse to confront. Let me say that. You can't conquer what you refuse to confront. Some of you have medical issues been going on forever. You need to go to the doctor. Well, I believe Jesus is going to heal me, but he hasn't yet. Jesus said the sick need a physician. It doesn't mean that the physician will heal you, but it does mean you can have a really good assessment at least how to pray. Yeah. Just need to assess the problem. Yeah, so Some of you have relationships that are just on the rocks, and they have been for years. 
And you just kind of like, oh, that's the way it is, the way it's always will be. And I'm like, or not. Maybe not. What if you tried again? What if you reached out again? What if you wrote a letter? But I, don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't tell you what to do, except for I want to say, what if Cornelius and Peter are both having an encounter? Yeah. What if you're having an encounter about the person that, you're, that you have an estranged relationship with, and they're also having an encounter? Well, what if they don't? Then it'll be what it's always been. Are you with me? Survey the walls. Number two, have a, an accurate assessment of your own participation in the process of both success and failure. I'm going to read you this one. Uh, Romans 12, 3 says, for, the, for through the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think as to have sound judgment. So you, you're analyzing the game. Are we winning or are we losing? <laughs> Do we have the best strategy? We got a lot of yards. Are we scoring? (laughs) We're putting a lot of effort into something. Are we really winning? Are we doing stuff that God wants? We may have God attitudes, but do we are we doing stuff God's assigned us to? Number two, assess your own participation in the process. Like, is it possible that we're failing because of me? (laughs) Not in spite of me. Well, Lord, I know it's Johnny. You know, he just, if you would just, you know, take him home earlier. <laughs> or it's my wife. You know, it's just I'm in this bad marriage. Yeah. Well, maybe you're part of why it's bad. Possible. Or maybe differently, maybe you're part of why it's not good. <laughs> it's hard to look at your own stuff. Are you with me? Number three, develop a Holy Spirit-led plan to achieve a different outcome. This is kind of Joshua 1 where, you know, the Israelites have been trying to, for 40 years, get to the promised land. Moses dies, and God goes, Joshua, let's have a halftime conversation. (laughs) You've been 40 years here? (laughs) Okay. Now, I'm going to be with Moses. I'm going to be with you just like I was with Moses. I'm sure Joshua's like, oh, that didn't work. You were with Moses and we didn't make it. God's like, yeah, but come here. We got a new strategy. Here's the strategy. And he begins to tell him, I want you to be strong and courageous. I don't want you to be discouraged or dismayed. Okay, so so Josh, first thing I'm going to do is work on your attitude. That victim attitude that you've got from not making it, that kind of downcast Wah, 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 something's wrong with me. We're stopping that. No more of that. You're not a victim. I'm with you wherever you go. I don't want you to be discouraged, dismayed. I want you to be strong and courageous. Hey, hey, son, look up. That downcast attitude, that isn't a winning attitude. That isn't going to work. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to meditate Not on Moses didn't get us in. Stop singing the songs of yesterday. The way it used to be. Living in regret. Okay, stop. I'm done with your attitude. Okay, all those people that had that attitude, they are all dead except for you and Caleb. Okay, so I want you to get rid of that slave attitude and that loser mentality. And I want you to, listen, Josh, look at me. I want you to read my word. I want want you to so read my word and so meditate on it that you believe that over all of this regret you have. Then you will make, Josh, look at me. Then you will make your way prosperous. And then you'll have success. You don't think that that conversation was an attitude adjustment? You can read between the lines. If God was telling him to be strong and courageous, it means he wasn't. If God was telling him to not be discouraged or dismayed, it means he was discouraged and dismayed. 
And I'm pointing out that the Lord's like, we, listen, if we're gonna take the land, the first thing we gotta do is get the leader tuned up. We gotta get you with the right attitude. We got you, gotta get you thinking about the right stuff. We gotta get this right, Josh, so we can get that right. Okay, so this is what I want you to do. For the next 40 days, all I want you to do is think about my word, do my word, talk my word, and believe my word. That's what I want you to do. Can you do that? Okay, then we'll get you in the land. It's a timeout. It's a halftime. It's a new attitude. He leaves that conversation with God, and from there on, he has victory. That's January. That's January. Sometimes we are so invested in the wrong thing that it's hard to leave the wrong thing. I, um, I have two examples that I'm done. When uh, we, we, we sold our business before we moved here, we sold our business. And um, we had a escrow, the company that bought us was also our supplier. So we had an auto, uh, auto parts business and our supplier, Big A Auto Parts, who supplied us with auto parts, also bought us. So they, they had a whole bunch of franchise stores, so they were just going to buy our privately owned stores and make them franchise stores. And so we made a deal. Kathy and I would have come out with a couple hundred grand and we started an escrow, we opened an escrow. The escrow was supposed to be 90 days. And we went through this whole process, they inventoried our stores, they brought all these um, auditors in three times, audited our books, audited our inventory, went through the whole process, and at the end of 90 days, we were waiting for them to close the escrow, and it went on 120 days, and it kept going. And then in the meantime, we had made a plan to come to Bethel. We were coming, obviously, for free. We were coming for free. We, we came for free. We agreed to no wage until the school ministry got big enough that it could pay us a wage. But we had this 200 grand, so that's just a perfect plan for us. And then um, the escrow didn't close, and it didn't close, and it didn't close. And we kept calling, like, hey, and they would be like, oh, next month, and we have to, and then they inventoried us again, and then they audited us again, and we went through three inventories and three audits. And, uh, and finally, we're here. Now we're here. Two months we're here. About maybe not quite two months. And uh, one day, and, and of course I have managers over all the stores. We have three stores. And one day, um, and so I, I called them when we got here. And they're like, hey, the escrow is going to close Friday. I'm like, Friday? Because Friday never comes. They're like, it's, closing, it's coming Friday. And uh, okay, so I tell all my guys, hey, you guys are going to be, you, you, you're all going to keep your jobs. You're all going to work for these guys. And uh, on Thursday, I get a phone call from my manager. And he's like, hey, we went to call in some parts and the number's disconnected. <laughs> and within about four hours, we find out that Big A has gone bankrupt. <laughs> and um, yeah, consequently, we lost everything. We didn't go bankrupt, they went bankrupt, but the people who were buying us. Anyway, it's a longer story, but they basically, basically all, our 20 years of business, all the thing we built was lost, including our, our, our home that we built ourselves. Lost everything but our two cars and our clothes and our furniture. And after 20 years, we came here, moved in a little apartment. You can imagine the grief of watching your house that your kids grew, were born in, that you built, literally physically built, be on the market. We lost everything. And we still owed one, and after it was all over, we owed, we owed $1.8 million. So instead of having 200,000, we owed 1.8 million. Here's the point I wanna tell you. People ask like, did you learn anything? Yeah, I learned a lot. See, by about escrow, by, when the escrow got to be about nine months long, there was something very interesting happening. Um, 
warehouses, manufacturers, when you order like a number of widgets, what makes a warehouse good or bad is it's called fill rate. So if you order 100 parts and you get like 97 of the 100, that's good. If you get like 92, that's not very good. And if it gets below 90, like something's seriously wrong. Well, when we got to nine months, our escrow was not, we were in escrow for nine months. Their fill rate was in the 70s. And my guys were like, something's seriously wrong. And my point that I'm making is that I knew there was something wrong. But I needed to believe a story that when I look back, I knew it was a fantasy. Because I had been in business a long time and I could tell. And my guys who weren't even business people were like, something seriously wrong with this company. But because I had already invested nine months in three audits and escrows and I'd already spent the money I didn't yet have, I needed to believe that they were going to buy me, even though everything inside me screamed, they are going broke, and you better hope they buy you before, you better hope they pay you before they close the doors. And when my guys called me and told me their phones were shut off, I was not surprised. And what I'm getting at is this. Sometimes we get so invested in something that isn't kingdom that we live in a fantasy that it's actually helping us when we actually know deep inside that this thing is not worth giving my life to. But I am so invested. I'll tell you one more story. Kathy and I were coming home from Pennsylvania. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And you know, I'm a positive prophetic word guy, right? You guys know that. So we're, we're coming home and we're flying in you know, economy and we're sitting next to this lady and it just happened that the way they assigned the seats is Kathy, then this lady, and then me. And we could have easily asked her to switch. I'm sure she would have been fine. But it felt a little bit divine. In fact, we had prayed that the Lord would set up a divine appointment. So we get on the plane and we take off and we're in the air for like just about 15 minutes. And I turn to, to this lady sitting next to me and I said, Mary, how are you doing? And she looked at me and she said, how did you know my name was Mary? And to tell you the God's truth, I didn't know. Like, I just thought someone told me her name was Mary. And she freaked out, and she thought I was a stalker. <laughs> and she goes, how did you know my name was Mary? And I mean, she was so um, freaked out about it that she would leave the subject alone. How did you know my name was Mary? So finally, Kathy reaches over and goes, he's my husband. Sometimes the Lord gives him things. <laughs> and now she's like, so she's really nervous, and, and I'm like, oh, gosh. And I'm, and I'm kind of going, Lord, did you tell me her name was Mary? Did I see it someplace? I didn't know. I just somehow called. And I can't even remember my kid's name, so how would I know her name? <laughs> so, a few minutes, so like 15 minutes goes by, and I said, um, hey, you're married, right? She said, yeah. I said, oh. You think your husband's home alone, don't you? She said, isn't he? I said, well, remember the phone call that you got yesterday morning? And you picked up the phone and they hung up on you? And that's happened, what, five times in a week? She goes, yeah. I said, he's with her. She looks over at me and she goes, he is. I said, yeah. I said, but you know that, right? It, because he's had three other affairs that you knew about, but you just don't know about this one. And then she tells me that he's the head of a very large company that you would definitely know of. You probably have a computer made up by that company. He's the CEO. And now she is completely freaked out. She's trying to figure out if I'm like an FBI agent or something. <laughs> and so she's, now she's crying and she's scared. And Kathy's trying to reassure her. And, and finally, <laughs> finally she turns to me and she's like, what are you? Like, 
I said, you know why you haven't left him? And she said, no, why haven't I left him? <laughs> I said, you haven't left him because he's building you a house by a beach and you grew up completely poor and you like the security of his money. That's why you let him live a double life and pretend you don't know it. And all the while, you're all alone. You're lonely, you're scared, and the money has not filled the, your heart's purpose. And now she's in a puddle. And Kathy wraps her arms around her and prays for her for four hours. Now, I'm not in the habit of doing stuff like that. But what's really interesting to me is that lady knew that her husband was a two-timing scoundrel and did not love her. But she didn't leave him because the fantasy she created was greater than the reality she was living in. And I want to finish with this. Sometimes we have a life that's an unfaithful lover. And we've lived it a long time. And it's a fantasy. It's not real and it has no eternal purpose. But metaphorically, because we are poor and it gives us some security, we live with a lover who doesn't love us. When we can have a lover who does love us. And we're just afraid because we trust the lover who doesn't love us more than we trust the lover who does love us. Because we know this lover really well. Like we understand the pain of this lover, but we don't know that lover. And I want to say two things. There are things in our life that we've just done forever. Maybe we saw our daddy do it. It's never been fruitful. But we hang out with other people that have long branches with no fruit on them. And we reassure ourselves that we have this little bit of fruit. And that's all the fruit we're supposed to have. And I'm like, January is pruning. <laughs> Cut back to fruit and don't worry about what your daddy used to do. The value system of your peers. The value system of even other Christians. Those value systems... They don't matter. They're lovers you can't afford. And you have no idea what a little bit of pain of pruning could bring to our lives. And I believe that God is putting us in a half time. It's not there just to rest. It's there to Holy Spirit. Look at the film. Develop a new strategy. The pruning will be for a moment, and the fruit will be for a lifetime. Would you stand? You might be in the room, and you don't know the Lord. Isn't it interesting that you would be in a church, and you don't know the Lord? And, you know, I want to just say to you and to our family, online family, and all of those who might watch, even later. We all didn't know the Lord at one time in our life. So this is like no condemnation, like you bad person. We're all here because we love the Lord. Yeah. We're all here because we've experienced his presence. Today, tonight we're talking a little bit about pruning some things off our life. But everybody who's known the Lord for a long time, we've all been pruned many times. <laughs> and we all have to remind ourselves, oh, that hurts so good. <laughs> Last time I was pruned. It was painful for a moment, but it yielded good fruit. And um, I'm in a pruning process myself, so probably preachers always preaching about what they're in the middle of. So if you're in the room today and you don't, you don't know the Lord, or maybe you've wandered off and, and maybe the other lovers is like, you actually have a whole other lover, like another God, like another something besides Jesus. If that's you, um, I'd just like to pray with you and, you know, and tonight can be the beginning of your halftime and be the time that you get to start all over. And it's not a start from 
It's not a crappy start. It's a wonderful come into the kingdom, meet the Lord, and have an encounter. If that's you, if you just raise your hand, I'd pray for you right where you're at. Anybody in the room? Just, you just like to start over? If that's you right there? I actually can't see that far back. Would you raise your hand if it's you? Good. I, thank you. It is a beautiful time for you because, um, you know, in the, in the Bible, there's a story about the children of Israel crossing the Jordan River, and they leave the wilderness, and they, and they come into what, what actually the Bible calls the promised land. And I feel like tonight, like you are actually leaving a wilderness, um, a, a very dry land, and you're stepping into what you were born for. And actually, you ha- had some kind of encounter when you were three, three and a half or four, and, and the Lord has never forgotten that, um, that connection with you. And so I just want to say I bless you in Jesus' name. And, um, and I, I'd love for you just to come up. Tom, are you around? Tom, why don't you just go back there? Just the gentleman back there. Tom's going back there. Would you just raise your hand? He's just going to come back and pray for you. And uh, let's just pray for him together. Lord, I just thank you for this man. I thank you for his acknowledgement of his condition and his courage to raise his hand amongst many believers. And I, I pray, God, that tonight he'd have such an encounter with you. He'd have a Saul to Paul encounter with you and that he would be, 10 years from now, he'd be one of our greatest preachers. And I bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. For the rest of you, can you just put your hands up? I, I'm just going to pray for us and our online family too. If you, wherever you're at, if you could just stop for a moment and just let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this halftime word. I pray, God, that you would help us not to self-evaluate, but to Holy Spirit evaluate. And Lord, that there would be power, a power infusion in each case that we just talked about tonight in, in the Bible. In each case, there was a power infusion. And Lord, I pray that you'd break the power of fantasy over us, that you'd break the power of illusions and, and things that we've given ourselves to that we just... They were just afraid to let go of. Frankly, we're just afraid, Lord. And I pray that you would give us courage, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us boldness to actually leave the things that comforted us that actually have no eternal value. And I bless these people in Jesus' name. And I thank you, God, that these are our people. These are your people. And we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening.